that, now we're going to move on to the next item, which is a review of cases. So just like Devi, we're also going to look back in the year and see what cases have come up. Um, and I will now call upon my esteemed colleagues <laughs> to come and take us through the cases. Uh, Kelly, Kelly Thompson, Ramon Pereira, Alicia Gabini, and Darren Olivier, please make your way on stage. Let's give them a round of applause as they come up, please. Okay. You can hear yes. me. Yes. Are you on, Kelly? <laughs> Am I on? Testing. Yes. Can we have a clicker, please, for the presentations? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take it away, Kelly. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to stand here. Fred, I'm at that age where I can either see you or I can see my notes. It's one or the other. It's not both. <laughs> so the case that I've been asked to talk about today uh, actually concerns something that I think embodies the spirit of African enterprise. It goes back a very long way. Apparently, the Khoisan actually first invented it as a way to preserve meat on long hunting expeditions. Obviously, it's something that's been refined into the probably the most loved South African snack of all time. And of course, I am talking about. Biltong. Um, and this specific brand of Biltong in particular that you see on the left hand side of the screen, Tuckies, I'm sure you would have seen it sold in many stores across South Africa. Very well known. It's apparently been around for around 40 years, which, I, which seemed amazing. But, you know, time flies when you're having fun. Um, and you might not be as familiar with the product on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, unless you have teenagers who spend a lot of time on TikTok. Sadly, I am one of those. It's a sweet, spicy, sour, very spicy corn chip that comes from Mexico uh, and is sold by an entity called uh, And Grupo Bimbo is actually a very large organization, multi-billion dollar organization, lots of brands there, and they, they trade worldwide. So that's the, the case is essentially about these, about these two products. The case itself is rather unremarkable as far as trademark cases go. So Grupo Bimbo had a registered trademark for Tucky's Fuego. Fuego means fire in Spanish. So really just an indication of the spiciness of the product, as it were. Um, and Tucky's Biltong discovered this in around 2015. And they actually had an earlier trademark registration for Tucky's Biltong. You can see the similarities. You can see how they would be upset about this. So Tucky's Biltong applied to cancel the Tucky's Fuego mark. They weren't happy about it. Uh, Tucky's Biltong was registered in class 29 for preserved meat, sausages, and so on. Uh, whereas Tucky's Fuego was in class 30 for corn chips, uh, wheat, flour, tortilla chips, popcorn, that sort of thing. So they applied to, to cancel the, the Tucky's Fuego registration. So um, actually, let me go back a second. Uh, the case, as I said, fairly unremarkable from a trademark perspective, other than it took a very long time, although that is not that unremarkable too. About nine years it took to finally reach the SCA. Um, there was an initial decision by the High Court against Tucky's Biltong. They then appealed it to the full bench, and then it went all the way to the SCA. Ultimately, the SCA said these marks are similar, and the goods are pretty much all snack food, so they're similar to and they cancelled the Tucky's Fuego registration. This is where things got interesting. As is the norm with cases that go on for this length of time, legal costs had racked up and Grupo Bimbo had been ordered to pay the costs of the legal proceedings. They were then uh, issued with a demand from Tucky's Biltong's attorneys and Grupo Bimbo said, we can't pay, we don't have the cash flow. Multi-billion dollar organization, sorry, I'm just grabbing my water. Multi-billion dollar organization says, we don't have the cash flow. We can't pay you right now. We can perhaps pay you in installments, but guess what? They don't do that either. So Tucky's Biltong now is short of 
probably millions, we don't know the exact amount, but it would have been substantial in their legal fees. So what Tucky's Biltong's attorneys do is they use a very nifty uh, legal procedure, as it were, that we have, uh, and they attach the trademarks of Tucky's Fuego. So normally, if you get a cost order against somebody, you can go and attach their property, you can attach vehicles, equipment, stock. Rupa Bimba didn't have any of that. They, didn't, they weren't a South African entity, so there was nothing physical to attach. But fortunately, this section of our Trademarks Act allows you to attach a trademark in various different circumstances. One, you can hypothecate a trademark uh, as a deed of security, so you can use a trademark as security for a loan, and the hypothecation is then recorded against the registration. You can attach a trademark to found or confirmed jurisdiction, and I'll talk a bit about that in a few minutes. Or, and this is the one that Tucky's built on, fortunately was able to rely on, you can attach and sell a trademark in execution to satisfy any order of a South African court. So as you would attach a vehicle or a property or equipment and have the sheriff auction it off to the highest bidder, you can do that with trademarks too. Now, how does this practically actually happen? Regulation 43 of the Trademarks Regulation says you lodge the attachment order with the registrar, it's a specific form, a TM6, those of you who like paperwork, um, and you can serve it then on the proprietor or its address for service. The registrar of trademarks then endorses the register. So there's nothing physical to attach and take away and stick it in a storeroom and sell it off, but it's endorsed on the register that there has been an attachment of the trademark. And at the bottom of the screen, I have shown you exactly how that looks. So that is a, is a printout from the trademarks register of one of Grupo Bimbo's trademarks. It's Bimbo with a little teddy bear advice. And there in the history section, it says attached by Tucky's Biltong. So it can now, the sheriff can now go and sell that trademark at an auction to the highest bidder and Grupo Bimbo loses its trademark. So it's definitely an effective mechanism. I don't know how much those trademarks are worth, but I'm sure they're worth more than enough to satisfy the cost order. And what the likely result of this is, is Grupo Bimbo suddenly finding they do have the cash flow to pay those legal fees and, and really, you know, otherwise they will lose their trademarks. So, so that's uh, just, you know, attaching to, to satisfy a cost order. But what about the other reason for attaching trademarks? And that would be to found or confirm jurisdiction. The common law says if a South African court doesn't have jurisdiction over a foreign entity, so we call it a peregrinus, lawyers love our Latin terms, let me throw a Latin term in there, peregrinus of the court, the court doesn't have jurisdiction over it, you can attach property belonging to that peregrinus in South Africa to either found or confirmed jurisdiction. The difference being, so confirming jurisdiction would be where the court already has jurisdiction over the subject matter, but just not over the peregrinus, so not over this foreign defendant because they're not physically in South Africa, whereas founding jurisdiction is where the court doesn't have any jurisdiction at all. So it now needs to actually found jurisdiction by attaching the property of that peregrinus in the jurisdiction of the court. And this applies only to monetary or property related claims. And it's based essentially on the principle of effectiveness. In other words, a court doesn't want to go through the process of hearing a court case, making a decision, finding that money is owed to the plaintiff, only to find that there's nothing they can do about it because there's no property in South Africa to satisfy that debt. So because of that principle, you can attach property to found or confirm jurisdiction. Now, this also, was in the media quite recently, um, and you may have read about it. It made headlines when a Russian entity called No Fond Pravo, you know what, I can do Latin, but not Russian, so let me not try. It translates as Orthodox Television Foundation. They are a Russian media outlet that publishes propaganda about the Ukrainian invasion. And they had a YouTube channel on which they were publishing this propaganda, and Google shut it down. They said, no more of that. We don't want that on our platform. The Russian entity went to court in Moscow and got an order ordering Google to reinstate their YouTube channel and also to pay a monetary penalty, a hefty one, because it's one, that, one of those penalties that racks up every single day that Google doesn't comply. 
Now, what has South Africa got to do with this? Absolutely nothing, as far as we can see. But it's been reported that the Russian entity is now trying to enforce the order against Google in South Africa. And they did that by approaching a court and asking the court to let it attach shares and trademarks of Google. What do you think the Google trademark is worth? A lot. OK, yes, it's only the South African marks, but what is it worth if Google can't use their mark here? So obviously, this is, again, something that we're going to have to watch. The Google trademarks have been attached. I'm not sure that the court will actually find ultimately that it has jurisdiction over this issue, but it's one to watch. And this tactic is not something that's uncommon. We've seen it quite a lot over the years, and nobody is immune from it. Absolutely nobody, not even Mickey Mouse. So in 2006, there's Mickey behind bars. <laughs> in 2006, you might recall um, there was quite a, a well-known, well-publicized case about the song The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Copyright in the song was claimed by the heirs of Solomon Linda. And again, the tactic that was used to bring Disney to have to appear before a court in South Africa or actually bring them into a dispute here was to attach their trademarks. So all of the Disney trademarks were attached and they had many ranging from Mickey Mouse to Donald Duck to all of their movie titles. So we're talking again, substantial assets that were attached. Then again, because nobody is immune and can escape, FIFA's trademarks have suffered the same fate. So this was in 2016. You might recall that during the FIFA World Cup South Africa, Leslie Sidibe was the CEO of SAFA. And FIFA, post the World Cup, uh, instituted disciplinary proceedings against him. Their internal disciplinary, disciplinary proceedings uh, found him guilty of match fixing and ordered him to pay a fine and suspended him from football. He disagreed with this decision um, and he was obviously very aggrieved uh, and he wanted to have this reviewed. So he also approached a court and said, I need to bring uh, FIFA to book here in South Africa, let me attach their trademarks, and a court granted that order. So the FIFA trademarks were then ordered to be attached. FIFA appealed that decision and went to the Supreme Court of Appeal, um, and the court there said, well, they looked at the matter and they said, this is a review of an internal disciplinary process. There's an internal procedure that you need to go through, landing up actually in the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Switzerland, that's the route you should have followed. We don't have jurisdiction here. The fact that you attach the trademarks doesn't cure that. You can't just attach trademarks willy-nilly and say, right, now you've got to come to court. There still needs to be a reason for the court to hear the matter. And in that case, it just wasn't there. So the difference, by the way, when you attach trademarks to found or confirm jurisdiction is that the sheriff can't go and sell them while the court case is pending, fortunately. The assets are simply frozen, as it were, until the end determination of the matter. If there's then a claim sounding in money that's against the plaintiff, or at least against the defendant, then at that point, perhaps the assets can be sold. But obviously, if you if you pay up and pay the debt, then, then that can be released. So in summary, attaching trademarks is not only an effective way of satisfying a court order, but it's also can be used effectively to drag a foreign defendant into a South African court. Um, and it's something quite unique to South Africa as well. And if you think about it, I mean, a, a car or a, a factory even or stock, all of those things can be replaced if they're attached and sold. But your brand, that's a whole nother level. So brand owners obviously get very nervous when the assets are attached and, and this makes it an effective tactic. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, if you could just jot down your questions, virtual audience, please put them in the chat. We'll get to questions later. Uh, Ramon, you're up next. I am going to be talking to you about the AfriTech case, um, which is quite an unusual case um, as it's to do with confidential information, which doesn't come up a lot in IP case law. Um, and this one was all even more peculiar because it was reverse engineered from publicly available information. So it seems sort of antithetical to itself um, that it's confidential, but also derived from public information. Uh, this is the citation of the case, um, and it was decided in the Western Cape High Court earlier this year, um, and involves basically three parties, which is AfriTech, um, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Nolte, um, and Soil. There are other respondents, um, but I'm just going to focus on those three. 
Uh, what this centers around, uh, what the main issue here relates to fruit drying oils and in particular pyline FDO. So I'm not going to go too deep into the weeds in terms of chemical stuff, but just so you understand, fruit drying oils, as the name understand, uh, as the name indicates, is used to desiccate uh, fruit. So if you think about your safari company, you think about sultanas, raisins, that's who's using the fruit drying oils on an annual basis, uh, once a year, um, obviously tying in with the harvest season as well. The primary ingredients in the pyline FDO in particular is canola oil, uh, which is important because one of the respondents in this, which is the soil, um, is actually the largest producer of canola oil um, in South Africa. Okay, the facts of this case, um, there were two gentlemen, Mr. Overberg and Mr. Nolte. Um, they both created a company in the 90s um, called Afritech, and they looked to produce an FDO, um, and both of them were also directors at the, at the company itself. Uh, at some stage, an Australian company came to dominate the local FDO market because um, not all FDOs are exactly the same or um, are equal. And they managed to produce the Pylian FDO, um, which was of a high quality, but also very cheap to produce. So that's kind of sweet spot in that market. Um, and But that, that Pylian FDO itself or that formulation was kept secret, possibly by a trade secret. I'm not 100% certain with the Australian company. Um, but it wasn't publicly available information on how exactly they produced their Pylian FDO. Uh, the formulation. Mr. Nolte, one of the directors of Afritech, um, while, he was, while he was a director and shareholder, he studied the FDA filings that the Australian company had filed, so the Food and Drug Administration in the US, and managed to reverse engineer the, the formulation that they were actually able to make. Um, and in that way, then Afritech was able to then start producing this pyline FDO, um, but obviously do be managing to do it locally, and managed to capture or recapture part of the market, uh, the local market. They carried on business for a while, um, but eventually in 2020, Mr. Nolte left Afritech. And in about 2022, uh, Mr. Nolte was then approached by Soil um, to advise or assist on an FDO production that they were looking to produce itself as well. Initially, Mr. Nolte uh, identified that he had a potential conflict and he said, look, I'm a, a shareholder, I was a shareholder and a director of basically the largest player in the market, which is Afritech, um, so I won't be able to assist. But then obviously he changed his mind at some stage, probably for financial benefit, um, and decided to actually assist soil in their FDO production. Soil then managed to obtain its first order um, of an FDO uh, late last year. Um, and Afritech found this out when they went to their, their existing client, which is PepsiCo and Pioneer Foods, which is also one of the respondents in this case, and asked them, okay, are you going to be placing your annual order for the FDO? And they discovered that then Soil is going to be uh, producing the FDO or taking that order from them. Mr. Overberg, one of the directors, uh, or the still the existing director of Afritech, then managed to do a lot of investigation. Um, and looking at this case, there was actually a hell of a lot of evidence that he was actually managed to gain. And the reason he did that is there's very few actors in this particular market. Um, a lot of people thought Mr. Overberg was still working with Mr. Nolte, or still working with Soil, some of the other respondents. So actually managed, in my, in my view, Mr. Overberg managed to gain a lot of information, um, which obviously supported his case. And he launched an urgent interim interdict um, which is basically to try and stop soil uh, from producing an FDO formulation that Afritech is producing um, pending you know, litigation or a trial that would finally determine whether they are in fact using that or not. Um, the case was launched and there were two, basically two main defenses that soil and Mr. Nolte raised. Uh, one is that the FDO formulations are known to the public. Um, and the second is that Nolte's assistance, Mr. Nolte's assistance was limited to the process not the formulation. Um, I just want to highlight here an urgent interim interdict um, is something that keeps the uh, sort of a holding pattern until a final trial is determined um, and just prevents the applicant from suffering harm. So there's a number of uh, different elements you need to prove. One of them is that you don't need to actually prove that that, that um, that Soil and Mr. Nolte were producing the FDO. You just need to show that there's some kind of protectable interest. Possibly it'll finally be determined in trial, but for now, Soil needs to be prevented until, until that trial is finally determined. Um, and that'll become relevant to you now. On the defense of known to the public, um, in essence, what this is, it's an attack on the idea that, that uh, Afritech doesn't hold any protectable interest. There is no prima facie right. Uh, the confidential information was available to the public. And Soil and Mr. Nolte in, uh, supported this argument, obviously, from the fact that that information or the confidential information Afritech is trying to assert was actually derived from the FDA, which is publicly available. So how can confidential information be derived from publicly available information? 
some of the things that the court looked at. Um, one of the things in particular was that Afritech's FDO formulation itself was never disclosed. They had a number of NDAs in place, and they covered a lot of different things. Um, but I think one of the primary things that the court looked at um, was actually a disclosure that Mr. Overberg managed to get uh, between Mr. Nolte and Soil originally. Um, and the primary thing here is that Mr. Nolte identifies that there is value, um, and in particular in the statement where he says they are using my formulation and know-how. So in effect, I own the local technology. Afritech, obviously, I mean, the judge, at least in this case, pointed out that he was a direct owner shareholder, so he didn't actually own the technology. It was actually, in fact, Afritech. Um, and the judge in that case found, you know, there is at least a prima facie right that Afritech holds the confidential information in the FDO itself. Then looking at the process, not formula defense, what this is uh, basically a sort of backup defense is that if, you, if a court were to find that the confidential information, there is some kind of protectable interest, the process, not formula is saying, even if that is the case, Soil doesn't know what the uh, doesn't know what the formulation is because it's confidential, um, and they're producing their own FDO, which is not Afritech's FDO. So they don't even know if their Afri their F FDO is the same as the FDO that Afritech is producing. Or at least this is what they're alleging itself as well. Um, and what this goes to is just basically to say that. Um, that soil is not, you know, they haven't contravened, they haven't made any, they're, they're not infringing that, that protectable interest of the FDO formulation. The court said, look, that may be determined in trial, you may, do, you know, the evidence may come out that there was limited to the process, not directly to the formulation, um, but the evidence that they, that the judge has before him right now seems to be a clear indication, you know, soil was producing a product and they started producing it in 20, or were starting lab uh, techniques to try and produce an FDO that would be able to compete on the market. They started that in 2015. They, they eventually reached out to Mr. Nolte in 2022, and then bang, a year later, suddenly they had an FDO production. So there was a lot of weight to looking at. It's doubtful that it was limited to the process and actually looks like it was probably directed to the formulation itself. Um, another thing that the court also seemed, I think at least, seemed to place quite a bit of weight in is something that Soil's attorney disclosed as well in response to a letter of demand, which is to say that Mr. Nolte um, acted to assist in the development of the product, not the development of the process, though. Um, and again, that seems like possibly semantics, but the, the court at least, again, this is the threshold is just to determine, you know, is there a prima facie right? And on the evidence, it looks to them that, you know, that wasn't limited to the, to the product itself. Just some other issues I thought were quite interesting from this case um, and something I hadn't, I hadn't necessarily come across um, is just always remember that there's a fiduciary duty of a director not to use confidential information while you're at a company for your own benefit. And that fiduciary duty um, in this case actually extended beyond when you leave a director as well. Um, and the, that was one of the things that the, the, the case law indicates that that fiduciary duty in particular will obviously um, supersede, particularly if the confidential information has a competitive advantage for that particular company, which was, the, was, was in this case. Um, another sort of, I would say, minor, more than minor defense, but something they threw the hat in within as well. And with Soil was saying, look, even if you decide all of this, um, they did not, Soil themselves did not knowingly misappropriate confidential information. So trying to get out of the idea that, uh, you know, there was no, there was no intent. Um, and the court, I think, rightly said, you know, look, that is an inquiry that belongs in a damages inquiry. That is not, a, not an inquiry that belongs in an interim interdict. You just need to prove that there's a prima facie right that the applicant is suffering a harm. And then the third step is also looking at balance of convenience, which is basically to say, you know, what is the harm that is going to be suffered by the applicant um, having an interim interdict um, or, or, or having an interim interdict refused um, up until, you know, what's going to happen before it actually gets to trial versus on the respondent side, what is the harm that they're going to be suffering um, on the other side if an interim interdict is granted um, until, you know, until the trial, which could take two to three years. And interestingly in this, the court pointed out that FDO orders are happening only once a year. So, and that's their big order. Um, Afritech themselves, that was their primary source of revenue. And um, so in allowing, say, soil to keep on producing an FDO um, over, say, to the next two, three years, they could completely go under. They could have no more business. Whereas soil on the other side is a new entrance into the market. They, you know, the, the production of FDO doesn't really form part or large part of its revenue base. Um, they had, just to mention, they have another a number of different other products, the Well series, all of those, uh, the canola-based um, products, they already have that as revenue. So in granting the order, um, the judge also said the balance of convenience weighs in favor of the applicant in granting the order versus not granting the order for, um, 
of the respondent. That was ultimately the outcome. The interdict was granted, preventing soil and others, so all the other respondents themselves as well, from making, using, selling, offering to sell Afritex FDO. Um, and that is to persist until final determination of the trial, um, which again could take two to three years. I thought interesting to, uh, takeaways um, that can come from this is just always to remember that confidential information ha absolutely has value. And I think it's something that's often overlooked with companies as to, you know, that with, with also identifying what is confidential information. Because looking at the facts of this, you'd think there is no confidential information here. Sewell had actually had, I think, had a great defense in saying, look, it's publicly available information. Um, but that not, but, uh, but there were, everything was protected by an NDA. It's that work that Mr. Nolte actually did on behalf of Afritech, which was taking the time, going through the FDA filings, managing to figure out that formulation, he's gone to that sweat, that sweat and blood to do that, and that sweat and blood is what actually created the confidential information, arguably the IP in this, in this case here as well. Another thing to remember from the Australian company side, I don't know the, the, the reasons for not necessarily disclosing the, F, disclosing the FDO formulation or everything, um, but if you are going to use something like a trade secret um, or even to arguably um, you know, confidential information, you need to be aware of your regulatory disclosures. So in, in this case, obviously the FDA, you may have a competitor that could, so a trade secret is a good way of protecting your rights if you're able to protect it because it obviously happens in perpetuity. Um, it's risky. But the problem is, is that you also need to be aware if there are there any going to, going to be any regulated disclosures that your competitors would have access to um, and which would destroy your competitive advantage, as what happened in this instance. And then something possibly more for myself as well as just to be aware of is that you've just got to be careful of any disclosures. Um, an attorney that I, well, actually was my principal as a candidate attorney, well, they always said to me is that, you know, don't ever write anything down if, you don't, if you're not willing to have it read to you in court. Um, and that's something I've always taken to, to heart. Um, and not to say anything disparaging against the previous attorneys, and also we obviously don't know the factual matrix, uh, the background factual matrix, um, but it's also be very mindful of the words that you use um, in any kind of correspondence, particularly obviously with the other side itself as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. Alicia, up next. So I'm going to talk to you about what I call the Lego case. And I think for Lego, this case feels like, I don't know if you've got small toddlers and you've ever stepped on Lego barefoot. And you just go. I think that's what this case feels like for Lego. Um, there we go. So before we go into the merits of the case, I think it would be helpful for everyone if we just think about sort of a typical anti-counterfeit goods matter, because this is what this case is about. I'm going to tell you how it typically goes. You have an investigator, they're walking around, usually some China mall place somewhere, and they see something and they're like, that looks like an original product, but it's not an original product. They then report that to their instructing attorneys, the attorneys take instructions from the brand holder, and we all go, nope, it's definitely not an original product, plus they're selling like 500 of these things, it's, it's a concern for us, um, let's do something. So something that we then do is we file a complaint with the police, we say that those people are dealing in counterfeit goods. Dealing in counterfeit goods is an offense. It's a criminal offense. We then get the police to go to a magistrate. The magistrate, hopefully, reviews the complaint properly and then grants a search and seizure warrant. The police then arrive at that store unannounced, no warning. And they then say, in terms of the warrant that we got, we had to seize and take goods bearing these trademarks and we'll sort out the problem later. They then take your stuff and off they go, and then you enter into civil and criminal proceedings relating to the charge of dealing in counterfeit goods. In this matter, that's basically what happened. The store is called My China Discount Store, who had about 9,000, 9,500, what was alleged to be counterfeit Lego products taken out of their shop. Um, the investigator sort of rolled around, um, let's look at the next one to say, on the 27th of January and said, I think this is counterfeit Lego. He took instructions from his instructing attorney. They filed a complaint in about March, 2023. And in that complaint, they alleged that what my discount store was selling is counterfeit Lego. What are counterfeit goods? Okay, so we go to the act and the act defines counterfeit goods as goods that are the result of counterfeiting. That helps. <laughs> So now we go, what does counterfeiting mean? Oh my goodness. 
So then these are the definitions of counterfeiting found where in the definition section of the act, wah, wah. Um, and there are three definitions, but this case revolves around the two definitions. So one is about a substantially identical copy. That's called the copyright uh, counterfeiting one definition. The other one is where you say you're using my identical trademark or a colorable imitation thereof to the extent that your product is calculated to be confused with my product. That's what we call the trademark counterfeiting definition. Both of these, which is the highlight at the bottom, is it's important that you've got to infringe a intellectual property right. So in order to get counterfeiting, you need to have infringement of intellectual property rights first, and then something more. Judge Morta in this case is, you know, although the definition of counterfeiting is a bit opaque, his word, it is not the same as copyright or trademark. To my colleagues, I didn't spell trademark wrong, I promise, that's how it's in the case. Um, you have to have something more. It has to be something more than trademark infringement. It has to be something more than copyright infringement. It's trademark infringement plus copyright infringement plus. Then you're like, oh, these definitions. But counterfeit goods are usually easy to spot. Ah, if you looked at this quickly, you would have thought this is a menorah blade. It's not a menorah blade. It's a marona blade with slits and who knows what else. But that's a counterfeit product. A counterfeit product, because it is something more than trademark infringement, because it's something more than copyright infringement, they're fairly easy to spot. In this instance, let's see what the investigator bought on the 27th of January. We're looking at that Knight's parcel device, and next to it is the Lego. So what they alleged in the complaint is that the Knight's product and the Lego products look the same. The one is calculated to be confused with the other. I'm sure you're pretty much feeling like me going, oh. Then the, we, we've got, maybe if we use some other Lego products and then maybe it becomes better, um, not really. In addition to the night product, they also bought this Mind City product. And then you're like, hmm, okay, okay. Maybe there's a Lego product, but there was no Lego product. So they're like, okay, the outside packaging, I don't really see the case. I'm struggling a little bit, but okay. Then they're like, okay, but what about the figurine? So if you look at the figurine, that helmet would be detachable. So then maybe the helmet is a bit, looks very close to the Lego little figurines that you find. And you're like, okay, maybe there's a case here, let's see. In the complaint affidavit, which is an affidavit, it's the application to get a warrant is done ex parte, nobody's there. Um, you have to have extreme good faith. You, there's no evidence, so there's no trial. You can't speak to your case. Everything must be there on paper. You must support what you say by evidence and documents. And if you don't, your case will fall. Yeah, they say the leg, all these devices or the, or the products that we just saw, either have the Lego device trademark. I thought, oh, didn't see that one. The word Lego wasn't there. Or the 3D figurine. So like maybe for the 3D figurine, there's a bit of a case. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But for some bizarre reason that nobody can understand, the warrant, which is granted, the thing that says you can go into the shop, you can take the stuff, but you must take stuff that bear the following trademarks. Lego device, a Lego block, no Lego blocks, I didn't see blocks. The trademark Duplo, you're like, Duplo? No. Friends, we might all be friends, but I didn't see friends. Ninjigo, Ninjigo, there's no Ninjigo. Where's the Ninjigo? And then you're like, okay, I think they sort of stuffed this up, right? As you say, you know, first you've got to get trademark infringement. So to get trademark infringement, it's use of an identical or confusingly similar trademark in relation to the same or similar goods. No Lego trademark, no Lego device trademark. They might have been to the 3D figurine if you looked inside the boxes, but that wasn't on the warrant. So then why was the warrant granted? Then you go, the judge goes on to reason that maybe what they were trying to say or what they attempted to say is that use of the 3D figurine in 2D form on the boxes. So now you're feeling like me. Let's look at these boxes. The use of the 3D figurine somewhere, the guy on the ship, the boat racing on the box is trademark infringement. I don't know about that. Then all you were trying to say that use of the 3D figurine registration, the actual figurine inside the box was trademark infringement. As mentioned earlier, that could have been a solution for them, but it wasn't on the warrant. So the trademark infringement case, never mind the counterfeiting case, falls flat. Then in the warrant, they also alleged, okay, let's do copyright infringement, you know, if you can't throw everything at everyone. 
But in the copyright infringement claim, you also have to set out certain things. You must allege and prove that the work is original. You must say, what is the work? Are we talking about broadcast? Are we talking about literally work? Are we talking about artistic work? No such thing. Has the work been reduced to material form? Has copyright been conferred? Has the copyright term expired? None of this is mentioned in the complaint. Mm -hmm. The complaint is getting more and more shaky. It's feeling like those pancakes that my children mix and they're not quite coming together. The complainant is the owner of the copyright in the work. How do you get ownership? Was it assigned to you? Was it an employee? What was the story? Then you need to say, we took the one product, we took the other product, we compared them to each other, and we can see that there's an identity between the two copyright protected works. That wasn't done. And even if you do that, so even if I call my Apple, Apple, you have to say that I've copied. So you need to show, show some causal connection to show that there was actually copying. And the more everyday something is, the less likely copying is, you know, the less ordinary it is, you know, maybe you did copy. In the end, Judge Morta says in paragraph 36 of his judgment, it is difficult to argue with the statement in the founding affidavit that it is unclear to the applicant. Now, remember, the applicant is the person trying to put the warrant aside at the stage. How the magistrate, Mosese, could have issued a warrant relating to trademarks and copyrights, which was not before on the papers. It just appears that she simply did not apply her mind. It's a bit harsh. And then the case goes. There's no claim. The warrant's been set aside. The nine and a half thousand plus products have been handed back. The criminal complaint, which has been lodged against the parties, must now be withdrawn because now you must bear in mind that the directors of the company were charged criminally with an act of dealing and counterfeit. They had to appear in the court in Benoni. When if you look deeply into it, the warrant should never have been granted in the first place. Currently, I understand this is not our case, um, that the attorneys who have lost on behalf of Lego have filed an application for leave to appeal. And as I've explained it to you, I think it's with great difficulty that I can see that another court has any reasonable chance of coming to any other conclusion, then the warrant shouldn't have been granted. But we'll wait and see. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Darren, you're up next. Thanks very much, Alicia. Hello, everyone. It got me for the last 10 minutes to get to exchange control. It's a wonderful subject uh, before we can take a comfort break. Um, and I see some heavies just rocked in. Welcome. Uh, nice to see you. Um, first question, uh, has anyone dealt with exchange control at all with, in respect of intellectual property? Is anyone aware of it? I mean, just by show of hands. All right, we've got a couple of show of hands, mostly attorneys. Uh, second question, is anyone comfortable with their understanding of how it all works? Um, I guess by the lack of show of hands, uh, we, we all sit in the same boat. And that's the, the health warning on this particular show. No, not really a show, but just a presentation. Um, it is tricky, exchange control and intellectual property. Um, and if one had to draw a Venn diagram, that's, I think, how it would look. Right. So I'm going to go. So it does mean, though, that I have to just go back to the beginning, really, and then take you through it. Uh, and I've tried to do this as simply as possibly as possible, uh, because in 2024, uh, there was a signal by the, the government, effectively, uh, to say that they would relax exchange control approvals. Um, and we all hoped that one, either they would be provide clarity or that would be perhaps gone forever. I think that was wishful thinking, but let's have a look. So here we go. Uh, Section 10.1c of the exchange control regs, no person shall, without the permission of the te uh, Treasury, enter into any transaction whereby capital or the right to capital is directly or indirectly exported from the Republic. You can't sell something without getting permission from our exchange control. Um, and then 3.1c is that any funds that come from South Africa and you want to take them out, you need exchange control approval. In, in an IP context, that's often in relation to royalties uh, for a license agreement. So we know those. That's not, uh, that's not new. Um, the word shall, though, uh, exposes any agreement to the contrary to the argument that it is null and void. So in other words, if you don't get exchange control approval, you take a risk of an argument that the transaction is null and void. 
Now, of course, in the, when this was promulgated, by the way, IP wasn't even in the minds of the people who wrote the legislature for this. Right? It's only, well, before I get there, actually, before if you don't, not only would, could your transaction be null and void, but there are penalties. Those penalties are quite stiff, right? You can be guilty of an offense, a criminal offense. Um, there's a fine not exceeding 250,000 rand or imprisonment of five years or both. Now, 250,000 rand actually may not be a lot if we talk about a huge transaction, um, but it does expose directors to liability and it is a, a very effective deterrent, uh, these penalties. So let's just quickly go back to our case law summary, which I talked about earlier. Cuve versus Red Dot, those familiar, 2004, just a reminder. The judge held there that the rights and titles in the patent application themselves had a monetary value and therefore was capital, and therefore was capital by 10.1c. That's the first time that IP got into the minds of us. It sent a bit of a shockwave through IP community, brand owners, IP owners, M&A transaction lawyers, uh, that they needed to get permission for uh, those deals. And many of them have not been sought specifically in relation to intellectual property. Along comes Oilwell, brought by this very firm, um, and Harams, a very smart uh, judge uh, with a full bench, decides the contrary, overrules Red Dot and says um, that in the context of trademarks, that rights uh, in IP were not capital. And the justification for that, uh, there's a lot of justification in the judgment, and it is useful uh, because it still has ongoing effect. But reverting to trademark rights, like all other intellectual property rights, they are territorial and akin to immovables, and therefore can't be transferred like a piece of land, right? Of course, He's not often wrong, Mr. Harams, but the, he, there is a hole there because in the Copyright Act, it specifically says that copyrights shall be treated as a movable property. So you can see there's confusion trying to put a, you know, a wedge into a round hole. That's that's what it's tantamount to. But this created some ease for uh, IP owners and those involved in transactions. And he went further to say that. Also, the elusive intentional meaning expressed in the regulations showing how difficult it was. Um, to add, this is about the cancellation of the contract of the transaction, would be and to add irremedial invalidity to the transaction would amount to overkill, right? And then consequently, the agreement without more would not be declared null and void. That was quite comforting. Um, and that there's nothing in the treasury that could say that they could grant consent after the event. So both of those created a bit of comfort to the community. Right, the response from the legislature is that they changed the regs. So specifically then included intellectual property rights within the, the definition of capital um, and went even further because I talked about registered or unregistered intellectual property, confidential information potentially, um, but certainly things like, um, and, and then they went further, talk about export is the creation of a hypothetic or security over. So they intended for this to be quite wide. Right. At that stage, there was a debate about whether licensing would in fact be covered by this. And as, a, as an, out of an abundance of caution, most advisors are saying, yes, if you've got a license agreement, get that, get permission for that transaction from exchange control with a non-resident, of course. All right, the, thank you. Right down to where we are now, 2024 budget speech. In fact, in the 2020 budget speech, eh, they signaled that they would relax exchange control. Um, and then <coughs> it was reiterated in, nothing happened really, and reiterated in 2024. And they issued a circular, I've just put an excerpt of that circular. We ex referred to exchange control number 2024 and the announcement made by the Minister of Finance in Annex E, et cetera, et cetera, um, that trade, in particular regional trade, is hampered by onus red tape with, and approvals. Some of the red tape relates to applications which must be considered by the Financial Surveillance Department of the South African Reserve Bank. In other words, exchange control, right? And so the expectation there was hopefully that perhaps they would relax these exchange controls. Public, it was issued for public comment. Public comment expired on the 28th of March. Um, and unfortunately, there was also a signal in that very circular that the transfer of intellectual property offshore 
as well as the use of share swap mechanisms will require approval. Okay. So at the very least, we thought perhaps to non-residents that approval would be relaxed. So let's look at, nothing by the way has been published in terms of legislature, but there we have what's called the ex Currency and Exchange Manual for Authorized Dealers. This authorized dealers are those people who are delegated responsibility from the Financial Service uh, Surveillance Department to deal with certain aspects of exchange control. And they sit within banks, they're great because Generally speaking, they're fairly quick. You can get your, your approvals quite quick, and they're relatively simple to uh, in, in terms of process to, to get that approval. Not all the time, but they, they do aid and facilitate getting exchange controls approval. But one must appreciate, obviously, that there's an element of risk in getting this approval, and it acts sometimes as a deterrent to investment, but I'm not going to go there. Two and three require some reading. I've tried to just highlight, though, um, what it says here is that authorized dealers shall, shall not should note the transfer of South African intellectual property by way of sale, assignment, or session, and or the waiver of rights in favor of non-residents in whatever form, directly or indirectly. That's what it says. That's what they are contemplating is going to be applications before them for approval. A waiver of rights in whatever form directly or indirectly. And then section two just talks about the non-related, gives authorized dealers the ability to approve to non-related parties. And then finally, in section four, they talk about the licensing agreements. And this is for the first time we see licensing, not for the first time, it's in it's been around for a while, it's just republished in, in October, the, the talk about licensing agreements as a transaction to be approved by authorized dealers. So that's where we are. The signal actually, despite what was said in the budget speech, actually comes across, if you read the the, uh, the, the exchange control manual, as far more onerous on, on, on IP owners to get approvals for these, these transactions. And this led to a swathe of, of questions actually just to our team. And that's one of the reasons why we've had a, brought it into this particular crammer, because it is really worth re-looking at. Um, Last two slides here. The first one is just the, the bold there. The meaning of arm's length is important. Non-residents in the common monetary area, just to realize that in the common mon monetary area, including Lesotho, Namibia, and Swatini, are not regarded as non-residents. So in a very small area, there's un unrestricted transfer of, of IP without the need for consent. Um, but the common issues here, you know, what is a waiver and a licensing? So. Is licensing a form of waiver? So, for example, if you say to yourself, uh, what is a license? And the license is typically just an agreement not to sue for infringement in return for a royalty, right? That's a form of a waiver of rights. One could quite easily say that a license is a form of waiver. I have seen advice by other firms, by other attorneys to say that they're two separate things completely and dealt with separately under the under the Exchange Control Act. I, I personally disagree with that, but that is an issue, that you have one thing called a waiver of rights, a complete divestment of rights, versus a license, which is a separate thing. I, I believe one's a subcategory of the other. Um, and then I've seen advice published um, where exclusive licenses are treated differently from non-exclusive licenses. An exclusive license tantamount being to a sale versus a non-exclusive license where the rights holder has the ability to use the intellectual property and therefore they are different and dealt with differently. I see no justification for that. Um, uh, and, and it's quite clear in, the, in, in KEMAD, at least from the Saab uh, point of view, they regard a license as a license and no distinction at all. And then the question of waiver of rights. I'm just going to quickly go back to this. Waiver of rights in whatever form, directly or indirectly. And if you go back to here, and what about a non-assert, an agreement not to sue is called a non-assert agreement. What about a consent, which is a day-to-day -day thing in a, tr in a trademark uh, practice where you give consent to another to use and register a trademark? What about a coexistence arrangement where there are waivers of rights on both sides for the coexistence of the of the of the of the trademark and a, a, again a very common cause agreement um, and are these covered 
and do you need to seek approval for these? Now, these are questions that are raised. Um, remember, it may waiver of any form directly or indirectly. And then what about transfers of know-how, trade secrets, confidentiality? Are these even intellectual property rights? They are dealt with by contract NDAs and protected by conf those types of clauses. Um, and to take it from the sublime to the ridiculous, I mean, the contrary argument to that is a trade secret legislation, both in the US and, and in Europe, clearly classifying them as a separate asset class, often included in, in intellectual property definitions. And one might argue that know-how, for example, is really just an unregistered format of a right to a patent application. So the nexus is very, very close, very difficult to, to, to clear out. But, uh, I mean, just in my mind, if Rossi and Sia go over to, to France to apply their trade, right, there's a whole lot of intellectual property existing in Rossi's head and also on paper in his notes. Who owns that and the ownership of those notes? And what if he takes them with him in his private capacity and Sari's capacity? There's copyright in there. There's brand Sia. There's brand Rossi. And this person's just going overseas to apply his trade. Does the exchange control regime does it extend to that contract as well what about a normal immigration so you can see where this goes right and you can see the challenge posed by it and that's why that particular slide is is very very apt right um and just some in concluding comments um the interpretation at least for me remains very troublesome um no real no relaxation of please imminent that's for sure. Assignments to non-residents require exchange control. We can know that as a fact. Um, licenses require approval, at least from uh, the, the exchange control manual point of view. Um, remittance of royalties, we know for a fact. Um, any waiver of rights in any form, directly or indirectly, potentially covers a plethora of different uh, transactions. Um, and a failure to obtain approval uh, has significant consequences, but invalidity of the transaction is not likely. Um, consent can be requested at any time. And if there is one area of the law, I think you need to have advice and just a document coming from a, an attorney firm. I, I do think this is it. Um, and so I'd like to conclude there, if that's okay. Where's Lisa gone? She's I'm here. She's like, Can you I'm here. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Kelly, Ramon, Alicia, Darren. Yes, I'm doing the Walk of Fame once more. <laughs> um, I just want to check if there are any questions for my esteemed colleagues. Does your brain feel like that slide? <laughs> <laughs> After all those presentations. Well, I have some questions. Oh, excellent. Can we get a mic? Thank you so much. My name is Jutani Charsley. I'm from the Department of Science, Technology and Innovation. Um, just to maybe add on to your exchange control, let's call it dilemma. Um, when we were dealing with Saab in the beginning, when the regulations came out and created that confusion, it was very clear to us that this is not a field that they are fair with. It's, it's something that they didn't realize the repercussions, what would, it would be. And we found them quite open when we engage with them that they are willing to listen. They are willing to provide you with, let's call it caveats or extensions. So when we dealt on behalf of the universities and science councils, we said that per implication, every researcher that goes overseas must get, get exchange control approval for making his presentation at a conference, yeah. theoretically. And so they said, no, that, that, and so working through this, we also realized that if you want to publish, um, you know, that assignment of your copyrights over to the publishing houses would require exchange control. They allowed for um, certain approvals, blanket approvals that we then communicated with our universities and science councils um, in certain parameters. I think it was at that stage, 50,000 rand for certain things. And we saw this now, some of our universities are working with clinical trials and those reports going to our international pharmaceutical companies, again, theoretically, will need those approvals and we are working with them. So I think as part of your advice to your clients as well, or maybe you as the law firm can, they are semi-open to be in, in engagement and see how they can help you while 
some relaxations are not going to happen or are going to happen. My second comment or question, it's, not, it's maybe just a comment. I think where the distinction came in between exclusive and non-exclusive is that you would require NIPMO approval for an exclusive offshore license, mm. but you don't need it for a non-exclusive license. And I think that's maybe where some of the confusion or discussions came in, that they made that distinction because in, in our legislation, because I'm from NIPMO, you need offshore exclusive license approvals, but not for the other one. And maybe, maybe that may have been part of the confusion or debate that made this thing yeah, <laughs> even more <laughs> a, of a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. That and brought I, a bit of Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I think those are great comments. Mm -hmm. um, and and when, if you read those that manual, you can see your input. And I, and I do see the... Um, it's glad. It's great to know that there is a reception there because often you feel it's like a, a dark hole because there, there are no published cases and no published reports, et cetera, et cetera. So that's useful to know. I also think that there is a role for the law firm because if you approach on behalf of a client, it's it's a really tricky tricky thing because it creates, you know, if they say no, what happens? Do I alert or whatever? So, yeah, those are good points. Thank you so much. Yes, there's another hand. Hi, uh, Colin Grieve from Afrasia Bank. I've got a question for Kelly. Kelly, in that Tucky versus Tucky case, let's assume that the South Americans never found the cash and that was went all the way to its bitter end and the sheriff then was going to sell the, or sell the, sold the trademark, put it up for auction rather. Yes. Surely that trademark could be worthless in South Africa because it had already found, fallen foul of the, of, of the, the local copyright le, uh, laws. So that trade, the Tucky's trademark, the Tucky's Fuego trademark in particular, yes. So that was cancelled. It would have not been able to be sold. But they had 89 other trademarks unrelated to Tucky's. Uh, group, you know, bimbo and a whole lot of little cute devices and so on. So those were separate. Those were still valid trademarks and they could have been sold to the highest bidder. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? No. Adele, do we have anything online? No. I just have a question for you, Alicia. Um, <laughs> the, don't be, I'm very nice. I'm very nice. You don't have to be concerned. Um, I'm just curious if Lego had come to you as a trademark practitioner, yeah, as a copyright enforcer, what would you have told them to do? I mean, I think I've had a look at the case several times and I think Lego's sort of best leg would have been the trademark infringement case in the figurine. Um, they should have left the counterfeiting alone. <laughs> well, maybe we could have tried the counterfeiting in respect of the figurines, but they should have focused on the figurine and built their case around that only and not talk about Lego word marks that aren't on pictures or products or device marks. Um, and I, I think that in this particular instance, the complaint affidavit could have been drafted slightly better. Yeah. Um, we do pump them out because there are lots of them. So, so maybe that's what happened to this particular attorney. Um, and, and they, you know, if it had been drafted better, focused on the particular right, I think they would have been more successful. Um, and, and also next time, I think the magistrates will also be a bit more circumspect because mm. they are not, they don't work for the brand holders, so they must apply their minds. You know what? The judgment that says you didn't apply your mind. Yeah. It's quite harsh. Not a good look. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's quite harsh. I just have one more follow on on that. Don't you think that maybe the strategy was just to use anti counterfeiting and get the stuff off the market? Um, I think that could be a bad strategy. Um, as I said, you know, counterfeiting as a species of law, it's an invasive um, action to take, to take mm -hmm. someone's stuff and then say you have recourse after the fact. I think in this matter, I mean, they took the goods in April 2023. This was in court only in May 2024. They got judgment in July 2024. Um, there's also going to be a hefty damages claim because they could have sold those products. They could have, you know, you face such a risk as yeah. a brand holder, that you should rather use the other trademark uh, provisions that you have, trademark infringement, as opposed to anti-counterfeiting. That's more to protect consumers and to take very harmful lookalike products off the market. I don't think it's the thing to use as a tactic. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll take that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Alicia. Ramona, I just have one question for you as we close off. Um, 
You said something about fiduciary duty of directors going beyond their employment. I mean, what the hell? What if it's five years later? I don't know. Exactly. Does that still apply? Um, well, I actually looked at the case that this one, because this one just basically had a blanket or sort of a person just said, yes, this applies, um, but without giving so going into the details. So I went to the, the case before that. Um, and it is, there's a the question of restraint of trade. So, I mean, how long is too long? You know, how long do you have to not act? Because you're obviously still a director in this particular field or in this marketplace. Like, are you just never allowed to act for any competitor? Um, but the case law seems to indicate that it's, in particular, it's the confidential information. Um, and it's the fact that there's a competitive ad advantage in that is with that confidential information that belongs to your previous company. And that was the key kind of takeaway. There was no kind of time frame or limit on terms of that um, one thing they suggested and that was to say you know the amount of time that it would have taken you to build that confidential information that's how long that fiduciary duty should last but in that case the court didn't decide that either in terms didn't actually follow uh, along that reasoning um, and just basically said that because there's such a competitive advantage from this confidential information um, that then it's just limited to that and it's you know it seems to it probably there has to be a, there has to be an end but um, but yeah as long as there is still a competitive advantage that that company has then yeah the fiduciary duty will exist. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we've got a hand. Thanks. Just a quick addition to that. I mean, obviously here we're talking about confidential information and not specifically trade secrets, which are almost like a subset of confidential information. But with respect to trade secrets, if the person who was at the company generated whatever that technology was while they were at the company and the company protects that as a trade secret, even though the person's left the company, that doesn't mean that, you know, five years down the line, they can then use that technology. As, as long as it's protected as a trade secret with that company, the company owns that or at least holds those rights. So in that instance, it, you know, it'll never, it, there'll never be a, an, a, an end, so to speak, and, unless, of course, it goes into the public domain. Okay. Thanks, Cho. Another, another comment in the room? Another one, this is obviously a thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's contentious. Um, the balance of convenience. If that wasn't there, how do you think this would have played out? So to succeed in the, you have to have the balance of convenience. So in order to succeed in an interim interdict is one of the requirements that has to be proven. It's always something that's got to be weighed up to it. Um, if soil um, was producing an FDO, but maybe, you know, it was only, you know, and had been doing it for a few years now, um, then maybe it would have gone a different way. If Afritech, maybe this was a smaller part of their business, then the balance of convenience wouldn't have gone in their, on their favor. Um, but the court in this one also paid a lot of attention to the fact that it's the it's it's in line with the harvesting. They get one order, let's call it for by example, one order a year from this really big client, um, and that's really damaging to their to their revenue if it's allowed to happen for the next say three years. By the time they get to trial, and they can recover all these damages, but those recovery of the damages is not going to actually put them. It's not going to be able to build the company again, build everything that they can do, and that's why the interim order was allowed in that. Thanks, Ramon. There was one more hand in the room. I think that can be the final comment. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hamilton PD, and I'm from the Twin Investor Technology. So my question is to anyone in the panel. So when I joined the university, I was told that we don't want to go to court, and we should <laughs> never drag us to court. And once you know, we get this infringement of trade or trademarks and copyright. So, what would be your advice that besides going to court, what could be other ways? I know you all lawyers, you want our money, but what could your advice take? <laughs> we want your money, yes, but we also want to help you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay, uh, can we get the mic here, please? N Nishan will take that question. <laughs> So I guess my question back to you is why don't you want to go to court? <laughs> it's expensive, right? It's expensive, it's lengthy, and the return on investment is probably not going to be great. I can tell you based on the number of cases that we handle, 95% of the matters that we take on don't go to court. Mm -hmm. You send a letter of demand to someone, they mostly will comply. So don't, don't hesitate initiating a matter and trying to resolve it amicably. Usually, if it involves IP rights, people know that they're doing something wrong and they comply. So you don't have to go to court. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks, Nishan. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the first half of Crema. We're now going to have a short break, after which we will head out into our breakaway sessions. So this room will be breakaway session one. Next door is breakaway session two. Next door to next door is <laughs> breakaway session three. Okay, so check the topics. Make sure you join the right room. Um, we will have a break now and we'll reconvene with the breakaway sessions at 11.30 sharp. I will, my part here is done. I will hand you over to my fellow MCs in the breakaway rooms. Thank you very much. <laughs>